want to uh, take a little bit of time to tell you a little bit about Nathan before he starts his presentation. Uh, he is a Stanford educated St Stanford Law School uh, graduate. So I think one important thing about Nathan is he has the brains to make this happen. Um, and as we saw, he has the compassion to make it happen. And he has the uh, real world practical experience to make it happen. And that's, those are the things that you need. Many of us maybe have uh, one or two of those uh, characteristics, maybe not all three. So, so I am, and all of us, I'm sure, are glad that he can be here. He started uh, this fight while he was still in law school. He was on the board of the San Francisco ASPCA. Uh, uh, on the campus of Stanford, they had a big problem with feral cats, and they even got involved with that fight, won it. And uh, today, there is still a cat organization at Stanford called the Stanford Cat Network. And it's uh, you know, publicly known for a very successful trap, neuter, return program that really got an out of control situation under control. So right from that uh, very humble beginning, uh, he started. And uh, from there, you know, we saw that he worked at uh, Thompson's County SPCA, which is near Ithaca, New York. I also worked uh, with HSUS and ASPCA to get them to reform some of those policies, make them a little more uh, no-kill, which is a very big deal. And uh, mahalo, brother, for that. Um, he, uh, after he worked at Tompkins, he left Tompkins, and that's when he founded the No-Kill Advocacy Center. And that was in 2004, so that was sort of Time equals zero, uh, as we say. Um, and from there, uh, the, the latest that I read is that as of today, over 40 million people live in towns and cities which are no-kill towns and cities. So it's grown from one center to a couple hundred and 40 million people, which is a lot of people, but it's still 12% of uh, people in the nation, so still a ways to go. And the last thing I'll say is that um, Nathan has been to Kauai before, I know this, rumor has it, and that he uh, adopted at least one rescue animal from here, which became a pet. So that is great. Thanks for the connection. Non -flowery, non -flowery. <laughs> so, uh, this is the third time that I, I've been to Kauai, and the first time was about 20 years ago, and I was on a vacation with my wife, and we were driving along in a rented car along this, you know, off the beaten path, and this tiny little black cat walked in front of our car much too slowly. So I turned to my wife in the passenger seat and I said, you should get that little cat. And she got out of the car and she took the cat and we took uh, her to a local veterinarian who told us that, well, she's a little sickly so you should put her down, which we decided not to do. And uh, Alele Popoki lived with us for 17 years. The second time I came to Kauai, we had just landed, and back then, and I don't know if it's still true, it's been a number of years, about 15 years uh, ago, we went to a restaurant that may still be there, it was uh, in Hanalei called Postcards. Yeah. yeah. And back then, that was the only place to get a vegan meal on the island. <laughs> and so we just land, we get our rental car, and we're driving to Hanalei, and we see this little black dog on the side of the road. And we spent the entire week, we were supposed to be vacationing here, chasing this little black dog. <laughs> and uh, we could not catch Henry, after, named after Henry Bird. Uh, we could not catch Henry, uh, so I called the Kauai Humane Society. I said, if you can catch him, I'll pay to fly him over to San Francisco and we'll take him. And they did. 
a week later, we got a phone call that he was on the next flight out, and Henry lived for another 10 years. So this is the third time I've been to the island. I don't want any more animals. <laughs> so my, my hope is that I can at least help you get your problem under control so that I don't have to take any more home. <laughs> and how, how you do that, I want to start the discussion of how you do that by telling you a story of what happened uh, one day after Tompkins County became an Oak Hill community. So one morning, a woman brought in a stray cat that she had found. And she explained to me how this was the first time she had ever brought a cat to the Humane Society. Like your Humane Society, we were the Animal Control Authority under contract. And she explained how in the past, whenever she came across an animal, a cat, that needed help, she ended up taking the animal home. Yeah. And she explained how she often <laughs> felt overwhelmed by the number of animals that she had to care for. How she had not taken a vacation in five years because of the number of cats she had to care for, but she didn't have a choice. Because if she had brought the cat to the shelter, just like if I would have taken Popoki to the shelter, the shelter would have killed the cat. And that's not something she would uh, ever allow to happen. So then she expressed relief and gratitude that Tompkins County was now a shelter in the true sense of the word. Some place that an animal lover can turn to for help for the animals that need that help in the community. So how would you like to wake up and actually spend the first hour of the morning drinking a cup of coffee rather than spending the first hour or two every day scooping litter boxes, medicating sick animals, taking turns with the dogs so that they can go outside and go to the bathroom. How would you like your bathroom to actually be your bathroom? Instead of, right, instead of a temporary kennel for the sick animals that you care for. Of course, you can still do those things. And my guess is that most of us here are hardwired to do those things. But the question of whether animals live or die in your community shouldn't come down to whether you decide to take your first vacation in five years. You should be allowed to do that without worrying that somebody's going to die as a result. There is a great disconnect between the great love that most of us have for animals and how the shelters in our community operate. A disconnect between the 240 million Americans who believe that it should be illegal for shelters to kill animals if those animals are not suffering and the few, the 3,000 or so shelter directors who don't believe that. It may also seem overwhelming and hopeless to think that you will ever live in a no-kill community, but it's not hopeless. In fact, as you saw in the film, others have faced the same obstacles that you have faced. They fought for change, they refused to give up, they harnessed the love and compassion for animals in their community, and they achieved success. But they did not achieve success the way we've been taught to express our love for animals in this country. They did not uh, achieve success by pulling out the checkbooks and writing checks to the large organizations, either in their community or uh, the large national organizations. They did not achieve success by signing petitions online, which were then promptly ignored by them and the people that the petitions are geared for. And they did not achieve success by following the dictates of the large national organizations. For how far they've come, and some of them have come very, very far, from uh, when I first started 25 plus years ago. But the fact still remains that there is not a single no-kill community in the United States that achieved no-kill by following the dictates or with the help of the large national organizations. Instead, our success as a movement is the result of individuals. Sometimes it's the result of small groups 
grassroots activists like yourself. They did it, and so can you. Uh, in fact, more than in any time since the death of the great, the late great Henry Burke, our country is closer today to living up to his legacy than ever. More cats are being saved in shelters across the country than being killed for the first time in our nation's history. Nationally, almost eight out of 10 dogs are being saved in shelters across the country on average. Killing is down to 2.6 million, and I realize that is a large number, but it's almost 90% 90, 90 decline from uh, where it was 30 years ago, so it's at its lowest level. About 40 million Americans, if you go back, say, uh, two decades, three decades, these numbers would have been zero. Today, about 40 million people live in communities where the shelters are saving at least 80% of the animals. 10 million people live in communities where the shelter is saving at least nine out of 10 of the animals. And there are about 1 million Americans who live in communities where the shelter is saving at least 98% of dogs and cats in their shelters. Two decades ago, no kill was a dream. Today, animals in roughly 500 cities and towns across America are living in a community served by a shelter that saves at least 90% of the animals. So a no-kill nation is truly within our reach. The question, of course, is how can you make that happen in your community? Now, another way of asking that question is how have others achieved success. Because what matters is not what you think will work. What, ma not, what doesn't matter is what you hope will work. It doesn't even matter what I hope will work or what I think will work. What matters is what has been proven to work. Because despite the breadth uh, of the demographics of all those communities that have achieved success, and they are very different from one another, some of them are very large, taking in 20,000 plus animals a year. Some of them are small, taking in only a few thousand animals a year. Some of them are very affluent. Some of them are in communities with high rates of poverty. Some of them are urban. Some of them are rural. Some of them are in the north. Some of them are in the south. Some of them are in very politically liberal or progressive communities, and some of them are in the reddest parts of the reddest states. Uh, but they all achieve success using the exact same model. So if you want success, that's the way to go. So don't complicate the uncomplicated. There is a proven model <laughs> with decades of success on how these very uh, disparate communities achieve success. And by utilizing that model, you will achieve success too. But what does matter is whether you are bringing reform to your local shelter, and you are on the inside of the shelter, or you are standing on the outside of the shelter. And I want to start the discussion of how you achieve a no-kill Kauai by talking about what happens when change comes from within? Some of you may be board members or shelter directors or somehow connected to the local shelter, and after watching that fantastic film, you decided, this is for us. We're going to make the change. That's what happened in Reno, Nevada. A board member of the Nevada Humane Society read a book by someone we all know and love, and decided that they were going to create change in their community. Remember from the film that Reno or Washoe County had a, per, had a per capita intake rate 10 times that of the most congested urban city in the United States. So it was particularly irresponsible. It had the second highest unemployment rate in the nation, so people were losing their jobs and could not care for their animals. 
Foreclosure rates were among the highest in the nation, so they were losing their homes. Washoe County has a city with the highest per capita felony rate in the United States. And it's also the second drunkest city in the United States. <laughs> and the first one is Boston. <laughs> so anyways, when I was in Boston and I told them that they were the drunkest city in the United States, they actually burst out into applause. They <laughs> were just happy to be number one at any point. <laughs> So according to all the traditional sheltering dogma, no kill should not have been possible in Washoe County. They were irresponsible, they were unemployed, they were homeless, they were committing crimes, and they were drunk. <laughs> but in one year, they doubled adoptions, one year after declaring their intent to be no kill. They doubled adoptions and they cut killing in half. And today, Roughly 94% of the animals that come in the front door also go out the front door in the loving arms of families. How did that happen? Well, the technical answer is that they are comprehensively implementing the programs and services of the no-kill equation. Programs like foster care for uh, underage kittens that need uh, round-the-clock care until they're old enough and ready to be adopted. Uh, foster care for animals who need one-on-one -on -one care that they might not be able to get in the shelter, or when space is at a premium, or because they're traumatized uh, and need a little extra special uh, amount of TLC. Comprehensive adoption programs, including off-site adoptions. So when people don't come to the shelter, they take the shelter to them. Uh, by holding uh, off-site adoption, adoption venues where people live and where they work and where they play. Socialization and behavioral rehabilitation programs to keep animals healthy and happy in the shelter or to get them healthy and happy if they come in traumatized. Medical care, both uh, as prevention and for care of already sick or injured a animals partnering with rescue groups who will be the biggest cheerleaders for shelters in a community if the, of a shelter if the shelter treats them as partners rather than the enemy as occurs in too many communities. High volume sterilization, uh, neuter and release for community animals, and of course, helping people. <laughs> Oh, Helping people overcome the behavioral or medical or environmental conditions uh, or challenges that they may face uh, when living with creatures, uh, other creatures uh, on this planet. So pet retention programs. So for example, <laughs> in most communities, if you were to call the local shelter and say, I want to surrender my animal, what do I need to do? Uh, the person on the other end of the line, if you can get them to answer the phone, uh, will tell you how you can surrender your dog or cat. Uh, in Washoe County, they ask you what's wrong. And if there's anything they can do to help you resolve whatever challenge or issue you're facing in order to help you keep that animal. Now, not everyone is going to take you up on that offer. But of those who did, of those who said, here's my problem, what can you do to help me, 59% of those people ended up keeping the animal rather than surrendering the animal to the shelter, and the animal was still in the home one year later. Proactive redemption. So if you were to drive around in a community and come across a stray dog, in a neighborhood. What would you do? Well, most of us would knock on the nearest door and say, do you know this dog and do you, or do you know where this dog lives? Is it too much to ask the people we pay to pick up stray animals to do the same thing, to do the kinds of things you or I would do for free? That's what they do in communities like Washoe County. They knock on doors. They try, they scan the animal for a microchip in the field. They do anything they can to try to get the animal back home. And in one year alone, they were able to leave 6,000 animals in their homes 
in the field rather than bringing those animals back to the shelter where they would compete uh, for scarce cage and kennel space with relinquished uh, animals. And communities that do that, that are proactive in terms of trying to get animals home, actually can uh, triple the percentage of dogs, stray dogs, who, go, who are redeemed by their families. And for cats, can increase 10 to 20 fold the percentage of cats that go back home uh, rather than end up at the shelter where they get lost in the system and then kill. Marketing and public relations. All programs and services that you can learn about for free on guides available on the No Kill Advocacy Center's website at nokilladvocacycenter.org. So you don't have to recreate the wheel. That's the technical answer of how they achieved a 94% save rate. How did it change so quickly? How did this community with high rates of intake, with all kinds of social problems, how did they cut killing in half and double adoptions uh, and achieve 90 plus percent save rates so quickly? The answer to that question <coughs> is leadership. And I want to share with you what leadership looks like in the shelter. So uh, at one point, the roads department, the Department of Transportation in Washoe County, decided that it was going to do road work in front of the shelter. And so as not to disturb the all important commute traffic Monday through Friday with people going to and from work, they decided that they were going to do the road work on the weekend. So close access to the shelter on the weekend so as not to disturb the commute traffic. What is the problem with that? For those of you who do uh, rescue, what is the biggest adoption day of the week? Weekend. Saturday. Saturday is your biggest adoption uh, day of the week. And so the work, uh, the road work on the shelter that would have cut off or limited access to the shelter would have been detrimental to the number of adoptions that the shelters were able to do uh, and the shelter was packed with animals. So if you were the shelter's director, what would you do? Would you throw up your hands and say, well, it's the roads department, they're closing access to the shelter, there's nothing I can do? That, in fact, is what most shelter directors would do. Most shelter directors uh, run their job entirely passive. And what I mean by passive is they open the doors in the morning, they close the doors at the end of the day, they tally the number of animals that come in, they tally the number of animals that go out. If more animals come in than go out, they execute the remainder. That's how shelters are largely run in the United States. To succeed, you need to be proactive. You actually have to do your job. And that job means finding solutions to the challenges <laughs> that you face. So what the shelter did in this circumstances is they took the animals outside in kennels and cages in the parking lot. And they had volunteers uh, dress they convinced the roads department to stagger the workflow so that traffic could be uh, open to the shelter. If you look in the back, you will see somebody and they are dressed up in a little dog costume telling people to adopt today. The party supply store was out of cat costumes, so they got a tiger costume. <laughs> That's close enough. Tiger cat. They uh, convinced the roads department and the construction company to pay for an ad in the paper asking people to come down and adopt an animal uh, despite the road work. They uh, announced that they were going to waive adoption fees that weekend with a Pardon Our Dust adoption event. Oh. Oh. And what happened? What happened was they increased adoptions over a typical weekend by 130%. Wow. So more animals were adopted that weekend than a normal weekend. What happened was, even though they waived adoption fees, everybody who came down to adopt their free animal was asked for a donation, and the average donation that weekend was higher than their standard adoption fee.
So they were able to receive thousands of extra dollars than they would have had in a typical weekend. So you have to say to yourself, thank God they closed the road. <laughs> because it allowed the shelter to double adoptions and make thousands of extra dollars that they can then use to help additional animals in need. Leaders don't throw up their hands and say, there's nothing I can do. If I can't do this one thing, kill them, then there's nothing else I can think of. When life gives them lemons, and in this case, when a hoarder gave the shelter a lot of orange cats, they didn't kill the cats and blame the hoarder, even though there's plenty of blame that you can give the hoarder. They did good things for animals, they told people about it, and they asked for their help. They turned challenges into opportunities by giving the community an opportunity to help through the Great Orange Cat Rescue. So those little overstimulation biting cats, you know, the kind that you pet for two seconds and then will whack you, the cranky little chihuahuas, they're not killed in Reno, Nevada. They are turned into petzillas. <laughs> <laughs> they're cranky, they're cross, and they're ready for forever homes. Are you up for the challenge? <laughs> this kind of approach also works for those run-of-the-mill black cats that most shelter directors will tell you they can't find homes for. In Reno, they're turned into mini panthers. <laughs> And of course, they use every opportunity to promote their animals and find animals home. So one day a year in this country, half the spouses and partners in America ignore the other half during Super Bowl Sunday. And what better way to get back at your partner who's ignoring you than to bring in a new dog or cat into the home. So they held this event, celebrate the Super Bowl by adopting a super pet. But when you do that, when you champion animals, and when you take every opportunity to save their lives, not everyone's going to be happy with that. And so when the Reno shelter ran this uh, adopt a super vet pet during the Super Bowl, they got some hate mail. They got a postcard. And the postcard said, adopt a super pet. I can't believe how shameless the Humane Society is at hijacking holiday and events. You even, leaked, you even leached off the Super Bowl. What's next? Adopt a pet for Arbor Day? Give me a break. <laughs> Sometimes it's Sometimes inspiration comes from the most unlikely of sources, and you have to run with it. <laughs> Getting a free treat on our day. So I want you to imagine you board members, or relatives of board members, or spies from the local shelter, or anybody connected to the shelter. Uh, when you go back and, and debrief the shelter on what transpired here, ask them to imagine what would happen if, through their pet retention program, they reduced the number of people who surrender their animals by 59%. Ask them to imagine uh, what would happen if they were more proactive in terms of their efforts to get stray homes rather than uh, passive. They would increase threefold the percentage of dogs and increase 20-fold the percentage of cats that go back to their families rather than need new homes or being killed. Ask them to imagine that through their community cat sterilization program, the, those cats don't come through the shelter, and when they do, they go out through a barn cat program. Ask them uh, to imagine that through a comprehensive adoption program, <laughs> they double, and in some cases triple, and in some cases more, the number of animals who are being adopted. Uh, ask them to imagine what would happen through their partnerships with rescue groups, their legions of volunteer foster parents, uh, the medical and behavior rehabilitation programs, uh, how that would mean animals are moving expeditiously, efficiently, effectively through the system and into loving new homes, 
into the protective embrace of rescuers or into the temporary care of foster parents. What would the shelter <laughs> accomplish? In fact, it would achieve what hundreds of communities across the country have done. It would achieve a no-kill community. And let them know, and this is especially important for board members who elect the director, anybody can do it. No experience is necessary to running an open admission, animal control, no-kill shelter. This is Sergeant Carl Bailey. Carl yes, Bailey was a police officer in Seagoville, Texas. And uh, he had no experience when his commanding officer told him, starting Monday, you're going to run the animal shelter. Oh. And he said, I don't, know the I don't know the first thing about running an animal shelter. And his commanding officer said, well, I'm picking you because you love animals. And he said to him, well, I love getting my hair cut, but that doesn't mean I can be a barber. I just don't know the first thing about it. Uh, so he had no formal experience. But what he did have was skills he could transfer to the shelter environment. And more than that, he loved animals. And he had a passion for saving their lives. And he was willing to embrace solutions rather than hide behind excuses. The end result was that he started as the new boss of Seagoville Animal Services in January of 2011. And one minute later, he abolished the gas chamber. Yes. Yes. And a minute after that, he ordered the killing to come to an end. Yes. Fewer animals lost their lives his first year running that shelter than that shelter used to kill in a single week. He ended the first year with a 98% save rate, something the prior administration, the professionals, the people with years and years of experience, said was impossible. Thankfully, the people uh, and the communities highlighted in the film you just saw, uh, and people like uh, Carl Bailey, are now only the tip of the iceberg across the country. In fact, Success in a one community leads to the success of surrounding community. So the great hope is that one of the islands falls into the no-kill camp, and that will create pressure on the surrounding islands. Yes, yes. And the reason it will create pressure on the surrounding islands, because when one community achieves success, animal lovers in surrounding communities ask the question, if they can do it there, why can't we do it here? And there is no good answer to that question. So when Austin achieved success in Texas, again, it put pressure on surrounding communities. And people started to ask the question, why can't we do that here? And then Williamson County saved over 90% of the animals. And then Pflugerville, Texas saved over 90% of the animals. And Georgetown, Texas saved 90% of the animals in Taylor, Texas saved better than 90% of the animals in Kirby, Texas saved. So do you start to see a pattern developing here? So we need one island to embrace the no-kill philosophy. Yes. Um, and then you'll start to see the stars on the map on the other Hawaiian islands. In fact, when the new shelter director took over the pound in Kirby, Texas, she inherited a pound with a 4% save rate. Now that is not a typo. 96% of all the animals that came in the front door went out the back door in garbage bags. And they went out the back door in garbage bags uh, with the litany of excuses that should be familiar to you. It's pet overpopulation. The public is irresponsible. There's too many animals and not enough homes. We wouldn't have to kill so many animals if people were responsible and how dare you criticize animal shelter workers who are merely doing the public's dirty work. Does any of that sound familiar to you? Yes. yes. She didn't embrace those excuses or hide behind them. She embraced solutions and turned the shelter around so that it went from killing over 90% of the animals to saving over 90% of the animals, literally flipping the shelter on its head. 
when Cheryl took over the Williamson County, Texas shelter, she inherited a shelter that served all 15 towns and cities that make up Williamson County. This was a shelter notorious for poor care of the animals and even abuse, the kinds of abuse of animals that cost them their lives. Today, Williamson County saves 95% of all the animals by embracing solutions rather than hiding behind excuses. Holly had never run a shelter when she took over as the boss of Chippewa County Animal Control in Michigan. Today, they save 98% of the animals. So what we need are people like Cheryl and Holly and Sergeant Bailey, people who love animals and are passionate about saving lives, people who would truly leave no stone unturned if it meant an animal lived instead of died. We need people like yourselves, no-kill advocates, to take over shelters across the country. <laughs> but what if you offer to take the job and they turned it down? Well, that is what has happened in some communities, and so the volunteers banded together and decided they were going to take over the shelter and run it themselves, even though they had no experience running the shelter. That's what uh, vo former volunteers did in Alameda, County, in Alameda, California, when they were uh, handed the contract to run the shelter after the city ran the pound for 126 years. And in one fell swoop, the director, who hid behind excuses, was gone. And the staff, who carried out the killing based on the excuses, was gone. And the policies that favored killing were gone. And more importantly, uh, the animals were getting out alive. So this band of volunteers that had never run a shelter and took over were able to save 96% of the animals, something the professionals who had been running that shelter for years assured the community was simply impossible. They did the same in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, where in five weeks a group was formed, uh, they wrote a bid to take over the shelter, they submitted the bid, they were granted the bid, and they hired the staff. And they took a shelter that was killing seven out of ten animals and turned it around so that it was in a few months, so that it was saving nine out of ten. The same thing happened in Palm Springs, where the shelter was sued uh, for claiming it was no kill, that no adoptable animal was killed, even though six out of ten, seven out of ten animals were losing their lives. Uh, and a group of volunteers called the Friends of the Palm Springs Animal Shelter took over operations of the shelter. They now save 95% of the animals. In Petaluma, a form, former animal control officer under the old regime, when they were killing, said, I can do this. I can do it better. I can also do it cheaper, which is music to the city council's ears. And, they, and he asked a volunteer, will you help me take over the shelter? And we'll hire the staff and we'll run it better and cheaper. They now save 97% of the animals, writing, we figured out how to save 97% of all our animals in an open admission city pound. By doing so, we have tons of donations, tons of volunteers, and tons of happy adopters. Animal advocates arguing that we have to kill followed by the usual excuses, is false. Kill shelters are on their way out. Modern, high-achieving shelters are going to make sure of that. Yep. That's how you save lives from within. Now, for most of you who are on the outside of the shelter, who are not board members or related to board members, uh, this is uh, how you achieve a no-kill community. And I want to introduce you uh, to Ryan Clinton. Actually, I want to reintroduce, to reintroduce Ryan to you because you saw him in the film, in the segment uh, on uh, Austin, Texas. Ryan is a person who knows you don't need to be in a position of formal power to be powerful. And in Austin, he decided his community, he, was, he looked around, saw that there were no-kill communities around the country, 
And he said, again, if they can do it there, why can't we do it here? And he approached the city council, and he laid out the plan for them and told them what was happening around the country and how we could do it here. There's a better way to uh, shelter where we don't have to kill the animals. Let's do this. We can do this together. I'm willing to help. We're not asking for any more money. Let's do this. And guess what they said? Absolutely, right? No. no. They, they, this is a city that was taking in 23,000 animals and was killing 65% of them. And the city council voted unanimously for the status quo. In fact, they told the shelter director, you're doing a heck of a job, Brownie. Uh, and in fact, uh, he didn't give up, though. This is where most people would give up. This is where most people would say, it's a good old boys network. Nobody cares. The shelter leadership is entrenched. Uh, they've got powerful supporters. The local newspaper will not print anything negative about them. In fact, the local newspaper is a cheerleader for the local shelter. Regardless of the reality, does any of that sound familiar to you? Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So in fact, the local newspaper printed a photograph of Ryan with a pit bull head on his body and chains. I mean, that's how much the local newspaper hated him and loved this particular shelter uh, director, but he didn't give up. He stomached the blows, uh, the criticism, uh, and uh, he didn't say nobody cares. Uh, and because he and uh, those in his group did not give up, uh, Austin now saves 96, 97% of all the animals. Nothing changed there in terms of the public. It's still the same public. But we'll see uh, what changed. What changed was, as you saw in the film, was the shelter's director. In government, nobody gets fired. They get reassigned. So the shelter's director was promoted to park and rec. <laughs> and if you are an animal lover and you're seeing this person killing so many animals in the face of life-saving <laughs> alternatives, it might be difficult to swallow that this person is getting a promotion. But yeah better that they worry about the size of the grass in the local park than have power over defenseless animals. Yeah. So uh, That's you know, true. good riddance and good luck. Yeah. And, but for your purposes, what Ryan did was create a step-by-step -step guide, a replicable model of smart political advocacy that will help you get through the entrenchment of the local bureaucracy, the local city uh, government, the local newspaper that favors a dysfunctional shelter over the values of its citizens uh, and allow you to do for Kauai what he did in, and his group did, he didn't do it alone, uh, in Austin, Texas and in the process proving that the excuse that nobody cares is just that. It's an excuse because if you follow the guide, if you follow the free step-by-step -step model he lays out, uh, people will come out of the woodwork to help and help you reform the shelter and force them to embrace the life-saving programs that they refuse to willingly embrace uh, and that most people would be shocked to learn are not already uh, being implemented. So on the website of the No Kill uh, Advocacy Center, you will find 17 free step-by-step -step guides that will walk you through the entire process of shelter reform. I just want to talk about one of them. Uh, I want to talk about legislation, the Companion Animal Protection Act. Because no matter what the social issue in history, Regardless of whether we are talking about the abolition of slavery, or women's suffrage, or an end to child labor, or civil rights, or disability rights, despite the different focuses of their efforts, all those movements had the same goal. And that goal was passing legislation. And the reason why their goal was passing legislation, uh, and the reason why it was not to get a promise from those in charge that they would do better, 
is because, and the, the reason why the focus was always on changing the law, is because without a law, without legislation, without legal rights, then any hope for improvement is contingent on who the election official is, whether half the population can vote or not. Uh, on who the restaurant owner is, whether people can sit at the front or have to sit in the back of the lunch counter, uh, and who the mayor is. And in our case, we don't want a society where the question of whether animals live or die depends on whether the shelter is proactive or not, whether the shelter is passionate about, the shelter director is passionate about saving lives, whether they decide to embrace solutions rather than hide uh, behind excuses. We don't want a promise that shelters will try to do better because we already have those promises. Nobody wants to kill is the mantra of every shelter director that kills. Mm -hmm. uh, and despite those promises, millions of animals are still being killed despite readily available, cost-effective, life-saving alternatives that demonstrate just how hollow those promises are. So there are many types of legislation as an activist that you can pursue to help animals. You can seek legislation to regulate or ban puppy mills, which would be a good idea because they need help. You can pass laws that make it illegal for pet stores in your community to sell purposely bred animals as they do in communities across the country now where pet stores are required. If they're going to have animals, they have to be rescued animals from the shelter or they have to partner with rescue groups. Again, that's a good idea and that would help animals. You can uh, work on legislation that ban bans cruel methods of killing, like the gas chamber or makes heart sticking illegal. That is a good idea because that helps animals. You can pass legislation that prohibits breed discriminatory laws that kill animals simply because of the way they look. Again, that's a good idea and that helps animals. Uh, and they are, in fact, all important. And if you want to do some of those, on that uh, uh, shelter reform page on the nokilladvocacycenter.org website, you will find model legislation that will help you pat, uh, help you with uh, some model laws and a guide on how to introduce and pass legislation. But the limitations of those laws are that they don't create a no-kill community. But there is one law that will, and that's the Companion Animal Protection Act. The Companion Animal Protection Act, or CAPA, establishes the shelter's primary role as saving the lives of animals. It protects all species of shelter animals, not just cats and not just dogs. It makes it illegal for a shelter to kill animals if a rescue group is ready, willing, and able to save that animal. It requires shelters to provide animals with fresh food, fresh water, clean environments, uh, environmental rich enrichment, regular exercise, and veterinary care. It requires shelters to have fully functioning adoption programs. Requires them to post all animals they take in uh, to the internet so that people who have lost their animals can search for them in real time and not have to choose whether to miss work or not so that they can go look at their animals. Every single one is online uh, and available for viewing. It prohibits shelters from killing animals based on arbitrary criteria, such as how old they are, or what color they are, or what breed they are. It ends the practice of convenience killing by making it illegal for shelters to kill healthier, treatable animals when there are empty cages, or when animals can share kennels, or when the animals are candidates for foster care. So it requires shelters to have a foster care program. It requires shelters to allow volunteers to help with fostering and socializing and assisting with adoptions. It requires shelters to be transparent, to be truthful about how many animals they take in and of those how many are adopted, transferred to rescue, or killed. Programs and services, as I said, that most people would be shocked to learn 
are not already standard operating procedures in their local shelters. Uh, so back to our example in Austin. No kill activists got political. When you read the guide that Ryan wrote, it will lay out a guide for strategic political advocacy. Uh, and uh, one, one of uh, the parameters of that guide is how to get rid of the roadblocks on the city council and how to become political so you get people on the city council who embrace rather than hinder your values. Uh, so they swept in pro no kill candidates to the city council. They waged a media campaign which required them initially to go around the local newspaper which was hostile to their endeavors. Uh, they also uh, took over the Animal Control Commission to get pro no kill uh, commissioners uh, on it and they passed a city law mandating the programs and services of the no-kill equation, and the rest, of course, is history. So it's no longer up to the shelter or the shelter's director whether they do off-site adoptions or not. They have to, by law. It's no longer up to the shelter's director whether before they kill an animal, they give a list to local rescuers and give them the legal right to take those animals before they're put to death, they have to do that. They have to do the programs and services of the no-kill equation. As you saw in the film, there was, with that recreation of that young rescuer in Southern California, that was part of testimony that the California State Senate heard when it was seeking legislation to ban the practice, how shelter directors were vindictive, how they would get back at uh, rescuers for exercising their First Amendment right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Uh, by holding the animals they wanted to save hostage and by killing animals as retribution when they went forward and exercised those First Amendment rights. So uh, as you saw in that recreation, there was a time when shelter directors could kill animals even though there were qualified rescuers who were willing to save those animals. Uh, a time when shelter directors could make uh, uh, rescuers choose one kid and then told them that they were going to kill the rest as retribution. That still happens in other states. In New York, for example, 72% of rescue groups reported their local shelter turning them away and then killing the very animals they offered to save. In that survey, one rescuer reported that when they picked a dog, the shelter's director actually grabbed the dog, marched, it, marched the dog right by them, and into the back room to be killed as a show of her power. In Florida, a statewide survey found that 64% of rescue groups reported that they had been turned away by a shelter. And then that shelter killed the very animals they offered to save. Now that doesn't really happen in California, and it doesn't happen in California because in 1998, the state made it illegal for any shelter, public, municipal shelter, or private SPCA or inmate site, whether they had the contract or not, shelters in California cannot kill animals if there is a qualified rescue group ready and willing to save their lives. Now before, and I want to share with you what that law has meant for the animals, and why that kind of law, which is part of CAPA, needs to be the law of the land in every state in our country. Kern County is just one of 59 counties in California. Before that law was passed, how many animals do you think they were sending to rescue instead of killing? <laughs> Zero. They never sent animals to rescue, and they didn't send animals to rescue because they had a no rescue policy. So rather than partner with groups willing to not only save lives, give animals an immediate place to go, but save taxpayer money from being used to kill animals and dispose of their bodies by using their own money to save the lives of those animals. They had a no rescue policy. How many are transferred yearly now that we have this law? About 4,000 a year. And that's just one of 59, and not a very big uh, county, but one of 
59 California counties. So why did it go from zero animals a year to 4,000 a year? Because they have no choice. Shelter reform laws give shelters no choice. We can no longer allow shelter directors to have discretion because history has proven that they will abuse that discretion. If you give many, not all, many shelter directors the ability to take one path killing or have to do the hard work of implementing all these programs, too many shelter directors will choose the former and kill animals because they simply choose not to partner with rescue groups because they treat them as enemies rather than partners. Uh, and so shelter reform laws give them no choice. Statewide, what this law has meant was that before the law, 12,526 animals across America's most populous states were being sent to rescue groups every year instead of being killed. That number now stands just shy of 60,000. That is a life-saving increase of 370%, and in the process, saving taxpayers about $1.8 million <laughs> from having to, from not having, but from killing animals and Excellent. disposing of their bodies. Excellent. How is it, why is it, that California is now saving an additional 46,000 each and every year? They have no, no choice. <laughs> Shelter reform laws give shelter directors no choice, and they work. In 2010, the state of Delaware decided to pass a modified version of the Companion Animal Protection Act. The law makes it illegal to kill if there are empty cages. The law makes it illegal to kill if animals can share a cage or kennel space. The law makes it illegal to kill if rescue groups are ready, willing, and able to save those animals, and much more. Since the law passed, killing has declined statewide by 78%. Wow. In fact, in the first quarter of this year, the state of Delaware is saving 90% of cats and 96% of dogs. How would you like that to be the state of Hawaii? Yes. Today, an animal entering your typical animal shelter has roughly, it's improved, but roughly a one in two chance of being killed. With millions of animals, 2.6 million, uh, the vast majority of whom are healthy or treatable, losing their lives every year. And the reason for that statistic, the reason 2.6 million animals are still being killed every year is as shocking as the statistic itself. In your typical American animal shelter, animals are being killed for one or two primary reasons. They're being killed out of habit, and they're being killed because it is convenient to do so. They are killed even when there are empty cages. They are killed sometimes within minutes of being walked in the door without ever being offered for adoption, or ever being offered to foster parents or to rescue groups. They are killed despite rescue groups ready, willing, and able to save them, and despite a whole host of programs and services that would uh, revolutionize their shelters and obviate the quote-unquote need to kill if only shelters would comprehensively implement those programs but unfortunately, most refuse to do so. In most American shelters today, killing is easy, killing is convenient, there is a built-in excuse, right? Somebody else is to blame, the quote-unquote irresponsible public. So why bother with the hard work of comprehensively implementing the alternatives? So once again, you don't have to recreate the wheel. If you want to promote a CAPA-like law in your community, uh, a step-by-step -step guide, not only the model law, is, is not only is the model law available on the website, but so is a step-by-step -step guide 
in getting legislation introduced the way they did in Austin, the way we did in California for the rescue rights piece, and the way uh, that occurred in uh, states like Delaware. But a guide to getting it introduced and passed is available to you for free, so don't recreate the wheel. So no matter who you are, no matter how small and insignificant you think you are, you can create, no matter how busy your life is, I mean, Ryan and others like him, the small handful of people that transformed sheltering in Austin, had full-time jobs, had full-time families, had bathrooms that were kennels, full-time pets, and foster animals, and yet they did it. So no matter who you are, you can create a no-kill community. In Seagaville, Texas, it was a police officer that led the charge. In California, it was a college professor who was tired of watching the shelters in her community and around the state killing animals when rescue groups were willing to save them and decided to write a law to make that practice illegal. In one Kentucky community, it was a pediatric nurse that decided to fight to end the killing in her community, resulting in a shelter with a 99% save rate. In Nevada, it's, it was a Marine working with a corporate retail buyer. Uh, though these individuals had different backgrounds, though they had different skill sets, though they had a different focus, they all shared a commitment to end the killing in their community, and perhaps more importantly, they had the determination to see it through to the end, no matter how long it took. In Austin, it took five years of constant fighting. And no matter how many roadblocks were thrown in their path, no matter how many negative articles were written by the local paper against them, they stuck it through to the end, and they succeeded. Their story can be your story, and you will be amazed at what you can accomplish if you just see yourself the authority to try. And if you defy conventional wisdom. And it is important in this movement to defy conventional wisdom because in this movement, conventional wisdom means killing. And so you have to come up with ways not to kill. There was a time when all the large national organizations, organizations like the Humane Society of the United States and the ASPCA and the American Humane Association, when they embraced a policy that said all animals under the age of six weeks should be killed as a matter of policy in shelters across the country. And in fact, they printed up 7,000 copies of that gem and others like it and distributed it to shelters and health departments across the country. Anything else they said was simply a sham that delayed killing. What was the idea that grassroots activists like yourself or progressive shelters, what program did they put in place so that they didn't kill puppies and kittens under the age of six weeks? Foster care. Foster care. They took advantage of the compassion in their community and they reoriented it towards saving lives. So foster care. There was a time when the Humane Society of the United States told shelters that they should not work with rescue groups. As late as the mid-1990s, this was still the official policy of the Humane Society of the United States. Shelters should not work with rescue groups rather than kill the because the animals would get stressed during the transport to the rescue groups. What was the new idea? Working with rescue groups. What was even the even newer idea? Forcing them to work with rescue groups. <laughs> <laughs> By making it illegal to do otherwise, as California did in 1998, and Delaware did in 2010. In fact, Delaware thought it was such a good idea, they went further, as we saw, by making it illegal to kill in a whole host of contexts, 
including if animals uh, can go into foster care. There was a time, and not so very long ago, as you will remember when HSUS said that any dog seized in a fight bus, regardless of the temperament of the dogs, regardless of the role the dogs were forced uh, to endure, even if they were puppies born in the shelter after the dogs were seized. If they were connected to a fight bus, they were dangerous and should be killed as a matter of policy. Well, then, if you all remember the case against Michael Vick and what those dogs proved, even though HSUS lobbied to have those dogs killed, uh, told the New York Times that these were some of the most dangerous dogs they had ever seen, and each and every one should be put to death. Uh, and then what happened? They were given the love, and the toys, and the protection, and the safety, and the care that is their birthright. If people won't come to the shelter, what are you going to do? Take the dog to the people. You're going to take the shelter to them. You're going to take the animals to where uh, people live, work, and play. But what if they won't come to your off-site adoptions? Then what are you going to do? What you're going to do is deliver the animals straight to their door. <laughs> <laughs> so itchy. So, <laughs> so in San Francisco, uh, the SPCA had a program called adopt so you could call on the phone and order a four-year-old calico cat, and the four-year-old calico cat would be delivered to your home. <laughs> In addition to getting cats adopted, this is such a great program because what else can the SPCA do when they bring the cat to the door? They can do a home visit. And if the home is not so good, then the cat just comes right back to the shelter. And the home is, if the home is really bad, then all the other resident animals come back to the shelter too. <laughs> so the good news is we are not out of innovative ideas to save lives that defy conventional quiz, uh, wisdom that is oriented toward killing. So Austin Pets Alive asked the question, what if we allow people to adopt out sick animals? Why are we tying up kennels to treat these animals in the shelter? Why are we tying up foster homes to treat these animals in the shelter? We can adopt them with the medication and, the, and they can be treated in their new home. They even take sick animals to off-site adoption events uh, because what, what could be better to bond, for a new pet owner to bond with their cat and trying to shove a pill down the cat? <laughs> Pewter. And that even includes animals with ringworm, with campaigns like Adopt a Fun Guy and Putting the Fun in Fungus. <laughs> in shelter, rules were made to be broken if it means an animal lives instead of dies. We can't have shelters hiding behind a paper trail in order to justify the unnecessary killing that they will do. So what can we accomplish when we give ourselves permission to try? Well, we can go from a 4% save rate to a 93% save rate. We can erase one day's worth of killing across the entire United States by adopting out 14,000 animals in a single day we can go from zero no-kill communities to one, from one to hundreds, and from hundreds to a no-kill nation. We can successfully arrive at the brighter future we are all striving for on the road that we paved that led there. For those of you who are not convinced, as shocking as this is, you will be shocked to learn that I was not always the smart, successful, and handsome, come on, come on, and handsome, <laughs> confident guy you see standing before you. In the pre-internet age, when I left the law to work in a shelter, and I couldn't simply Google it, because Google did not exist, I didn't know the difference between a spade or a neuter. And I was too embarrassed 
by my own ignorance, because I was the boss, to ask any of my staff, what is the difference? Sometimes you say space, sometimes you say neuter. What is the difference? And I was always amazed when staff could tell if a dog was male or female, and you know, just say neutered male by looking underneath. It just never occurred to me what they were looking for. <laughs> so I don't blame my Los Angeles public school education for my ignorance, and I don't blame my overworked and overburdened teachers or my parents. I blame uh, myself. This is, or was, the high school I went to, and this is me in high school. Oh. <laughs> Handsome guy. And this is my, the letter my parents would have received if they got to the mailbox before I did. <laughs> and it says, our records indicate that Nathan Winograd has been absent for the last 10 school days. <laughs> Excessive absence may have a negative effect on school performance. And five days later, this letter came. And five days after that, this letter. Came. And six, seven months into the school year, uh, a letter came that I had only been to class six days. And this was my high school report card. I am very proud of the fact that I got a B in auto shop. <laughs> Printmaking? <laughs> that, of course, is me, and that is George Costanza. <laughs> so if I can do it, anybody can. <laughs>